Well, welcome again to Women in Ministry Fellowship. Um, we come together as women in ministry to learn uh, from the Lord, and we, we strengthen and encourage each other in the Lord. We give God praise. It's been several weeks since we had uh, our Tuesday teaching sessions, and I'm really excited to be, to be here today. I'm really, really excited. I have missed, uh, missed you all. I hope you've missed me. Anyway, our topic for today is love-driven leadership. I thought, I thought for a while and I asked the Holy Spirit because I wanted to do something that is relevant to the now and I asked for the Holy Spirit's help. And uh, the Holy Spirit dropped this script, this topic in my heart. So I'm hoping that what I say will help us even at this time. Love-driven leadership is, is our topic for tonight. Um, 2020 has been unprecedentedly challenging, a, a, a very challenging year for everyone, and life as we knew it will never be the same again. However, one thing that has disturbed me more than the challenges we faced is the apparent lack of leadership shown by the church to the world in the midst of our global crisis. The most obvi obvious need of our world now is leadership. I'm sure you will agree with me. At all levels, the, lo the world is pleading for leadership. Governments are, they are not failing us. They really don't know what to do because we, what we are going through is unprecedented. But we have a solution. We have something. We have God, a God who transcends time, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, who is constant in all his actions. And at this time, I believe that the world needs him more than anything else. We need leadership. The world is pleading for leadership in our homes, in our churches, business, politics, communities, towns, cities, nations. There's a need for leadership. Yet it would appear that the church has been unprepared to step into the role and lead the world. It's something I, I, I've been thinking of for uh, a while, that we were not prepared for this. Even though the Lord has been talking about the shaking coming, we have not been prepared for this, to step in and show the world the way. In fact, the church herself seems to have been overtaken by events. And uh, she's perplexed as to what is required of her or what she can do. We've become docile, even seeking that somebody else would guide or lead us. We have not come up with a solution, a message, or we have not pointed the world or our families, our communities, and nations back to God. And this is something that is on the Father's heart because at the end of all of this, God wants to be known. And how can he be known except through us? As we enter the final uh, quarter of the year from October, I began to prayerfully reflect on the way forward, asking the Lord what he wants us to do, especially for our ministry. I'm deeply aware that the challenges we face will not suddenly dis disappear on, um, sorry. Uh, I'm, I'm deeply aware that the challenges we face will not disappear on 31st December. Somehow we think, oh, the end of a, a year and then coming into a new one will bring something new, but we all know it, it doesn't happen that way. And so the challenges we face will not be here, will, will not go uh, on 31st December. So there's a need to seek God's face. If we are to produce a solution or become a solution uh, for 2021 and the years beyond, then there is uh, the need to seek God's face. And the more I've reflected and the more I've sought God's face, the more convinced I am that we must return to the basics of the Christian faith. Christianity has become too complex, too complicated, too many theories, too many steps, too many uh, uh, philosophies, it, and, and they haven't helped us. So we need to come back to ground zero. We need to come back to the basics of our faith. We need to come back and teach the church afresh about salvation, about reading the Bible, about prayer, about faith about suffering, about carrying your cross daily, about dying to self. 
These are things which strengthen us and produce a kind of Christian who can withstand the test of time. We must return to the fundamental truths that were committed into our hands by the Lord Jesus Christ and start afresh from there. This is my, my personal uh, uh, understanding and, 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 and belief in reflecting and praying and looking at things from different perspectives. I have come to this conclusion and I don't believe anything can make me change my mind. Our effectiveness as leaders in this new season is dependent on how well we align ourselves and adjust ourselves to these basic truths. I want to say it again, our effectiveness as leaders depends on how well we adjust ourselves or adopt ourselves to adapt ourselves to these basic truths. This is what will shape, sharpen, and give our leadership a cutting edge. So if we want our leadership to be, uh, to have a cutting edge leadership, this is what will shape and, this is what will shape and sharpen it. Amen. Today, I want to talk about the principle of love, love-driven leadership. In Matthew 22, verses 36 to 40, Jesus said something. A man came, the Sadducees were asking him all kinds of questions. They wanted to trap him. And a man came and asked, asked him, Teacher, which is the great commandment of the law? They had many laws. Yet Jesus said to him, he summarized the law and said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang the law and the prophets. Just two commandments hang the entire law and the entire prophets. Hallelujah. That you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, your soul and with all your might. And you will love your neighbor as yourself. A principle is a fundamental truth. We've discussed principles on this platform over and over again, that we have to become people of principle. So a principle is a fundamental truth that serves as the foundation for our belief, reasoning, and action. A basic truth that influences the things we do, the things we see. And, and we need to go back to the principle of love, the principle of absolute love for God and unconditional love for others. Absolute love for God and unconditional love for others. It is the primary truth we must return to if we are to even qualify to serve him. If we are even qualified to call us, if we want to even be qualified to be called servants or ministers of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially in these days, we must return to this fundamental principle of absolute love for God and the unconditional love for others. If we are to be effective as leaders in this time, we must return to this. I want us to turn to John chapter 21. John chapter 21, I'll read from verses 15 to 17, but I'll read from the New American Standard Bible. It says, so when, I mean, this is after Jesus' resurrection and he came to them. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Meaning the others there. And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know, I love you. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, shepherd my sheep. Then he said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. He said to him, tend my sheep. sheep. Hallelujah. Jesus, after his resurrection, was preparing to commit his kingdom business into the hands of his disciples. These were not strong, valiant men. These were not extraordinary men. 
He had walked with them for three and a half years. Yet these were men who were, he knew that they were weak. He knew their weaknesses. He knew their insecurities. In fact, these men had abandoned him and even denied him in his greatest hour of need. Yet these were the same people he was committing his mission on earth uh, to. He was committing it into their hands. So it's not even about their strengths or about their weaknesses. And that is encouraging for us because we are also not where we are supposed to be. We are still weak. We are still insecure. We have our issues and our problems. Thank God that that does not uh, uh, sort of, it does not disqualify us from serving the Lord. Because that is not what Jesus is looking for. Jesus asks the question which every Christian leader must consider and regard as being central to our Christian ministry. At this time, every leader, every one of us must be asking and considering the question Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Because this is the central question, the central uh, 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 theme of Christian service, of ministry. The foundation of Christian leadership must be our love for Jesus. The truth of the matter is this, we can never truly serve God until we have resolved the love issue. How much do you, we love Jesus? How well do we love the Lord? Our ministry and our service must flow from this place. And that is why the question must be addressed. Do you love me? Jennifer, Abigail, do you love me? Is the question I must ask, I must answer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Our ministry and service to the Lord must flow from and must be the evidence and proof of our love for the master. The proof of my love for Jesus is my service to him. And yet we serve him when we do not love him. And our service becomes uh, religious, our service become, lacks the power, our service, our service to him lacks the dynamism that will influence others. Our leadership becomes weak because we do not know him. We do not know his heart. Jesus repeatedly asked Peter until it grieved Peter, Simon, do you love me? How many times would he ask me till I get grieved? Do you love me? Peter replied each time in brokenness, Lord, you know I love you. What Jesus asked Peter to do as a proof and evidence of his love is quite profound. And this is what we, we are going to consider today. That if indeed we love Jesus, then Jesus is saying what he said to Peter. And this is what the world needs at this time. He said, if you love me, Tend my lambs. If you love me, shepherd my sheep. If you love me, tend my sheep. They sound ordinary. They sound almost uh, casual. But these are very, very powerful words which describe what Jesus has called us to do. With these words, Jesus gave the job description and the details of the task at hand. With these words, Jesus informed us that what he has called us to is the tending, feeding, and shepherding of lambs and sheep. Whatever our ministry is, if it is not impacting people, if it is not strengthening another person, if it is not raising another person, we are wasting our time. That is, it's, it's very important at this time to know this, that the job description that Jesus gave Peter was feeding of sheep, <laughs> tending of lambs, shepherding sheep. Ah, may God help us. The only qualification and criterion Jesus required from Peter to do this task is love. And we've made it so, so complicated. We've made it so complicated. All that Jesus wanted from Peter is, do you love 
me? Do you love Jesus? What Peter was stepping into, the feeding of sheep and lamb and tending of sheep and lamb, only required love for Jesus and nothing else. But it's not as easy as it sounds. I'm saying that we need to step back to this fundamental truth that our calling into ministry is no different from that of Peter's and that the task at hand and our job description remains the same as Peter's. This is a truth we must come back to every one of us. That will not, it doesn't matter which office I've been called to. It doesn't matter what assignment I've been given to. The end result will be that the lambs are fed attended the sheep are fed and the sheep are attended we are called and commissioned to tend feed and shepherd god's sheep human beings hallelujah ezekiel 34 verse 38 god said you they are my you are my sheep my sheep are human beings god considers human beings the sheep of his pasture and we are called to shepherd sheep, hallelujah. Human beings created in the image of God. Our love for Jesus, therefore, is the only thing that will qualify us because our love for Jesus is not just vertical, it, it must be also horizontal. Love God with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, and love our neighbor as ourselves. Absolute love for God, unconditional love for humanity. These are serious things. As I prepared my message, I realized the weight. When I finished, I had to get into prayer. And prayer that I couldn't talk, but just listen to what the Father may have to say to me. We have been called to shepherd sheep. Now, I want us to go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 9, I'll read from verses 35 to 38. We are called to shepherd a lost world. We have been called to shepherd a lost world. And that was why Peter, Jesus had to, to establish from Peter, are you willing? Your love for me must impact others are you willing peter if you are if you love me then tend to humanity in matthew chapter 9 from verse, verse 35 it says then jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing every sickness and every disease among the people but when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherds. Do you hear that? He went about healing the sick. He had compassion. He had a burden on his heart for them. And then he saw the multitudes. These were unbelievers, unsaved, but they, they, they needed help. They were following him. And when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary. You need to underline these, these in your Bible. They were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. The Pharisees were there. The Sadduce Sadducees were there. The scribes were there. They had their high priest and everything. They had their leaders. But these leaders had no care or compassion towards them. And Jesus saw them as weary and scattered like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send uh, laborers into his harvest. Let's see what the scripture says. He says he saw the multitudes. He was moved with compassion. You see, that is what loving Jesus would do. It would give us compassion for the lost. He said he was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. This is our current predicament. There, is no, there are no shepherds. There are no leaders. Sheep without 
a shepherd. This is the intrinsic helplessness and hopelessness of the human condition. Sheep, weary, tired, scattered, with no shepherd. Sheep cannot take care of themselves. We cannot take care of ourselves. We try and try and we've made a mess. Every time we try, we've made more mess out of our world. Because we were not meant to live like this. We were meant to live in union with God. And we know that sin caused a, a, a separation between God and us. And from that time, man, humanity has, has struggled. And all around us, people are struggling. All around us, people are living in fear. All around us, people are in pain and anguish. All around us, people have sicknesses and diseases. All around us, people are oppressed by Satan. All around us, the, 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 even within the church, the number of people I have met in church who are oppressed under satanic oppression, they are sitting in Zion but mourning. In Zion but in ashes. And Jesus looks at these and, and his, his heart breaks. He is filled with compassion at the state of humanity. At the moment, let me tell you that this is the father's heart. The father looks with compassion. The father looks in pain as he, at humanity, weary, scattered, sheep without a shepherd, not just in the world, but even in his church. And so he's asking us the question, do you love me? Because I am looking for people through whom I can reach out to the world. Hallelujah. This is what Jesus sees when he sees our world. When he looks at the people around us today, we scattered lost sheep without a shepherd. And many of them are sitting in our churches. Many of them, we, we, we talk to every day. They, they, they don't know who to tell about what they're going through. Many are under oppression, beaten by life, beaten by the enemy, beaten by circumstances, beaten, grieving. Sheep, weary sheep without a shepherd. This is the condition. Many are gripped in fear. Don't know what is going to happen to them ne next. We have a pandemic across the surface of the earth, which has taken things even to another level. Sheep without a shepherd, no leadership anywhere. God sees humanity as sheep without a shepherd. Hence this call to shepherd his flock. Jesus is looking for shepherds, not hirelings. Shepherding is no easy task. Yet this is what Jesus has called us to. I said, if you have been called into ministry, if you feel that God has said anything to you, called you, called you to mobilize women, called you to mobilize the youth, called you to mobilize men, called you to start a church, whatever God has called you to, the primary task is that we will reach out to humanity. He came to set captives free. He came to heal. He came to bring the kingdom to us. And that is what we are supposed to, to, to carry to the world. This is what we are supposed to carry to the dying world. We are called to be shepherds. Yet many of us are hirelings. Many of us have become hirelings because we do not love Jesus. Let's turn to John chapter 10. In John chapter 10, I'll read from verse 10. A few weeks ago, the, I think at the end of October, I, I woke up in the night and I heard the Lord say these words. John chapter 10 verse 11. It kept coming. John 10, 11. John 10, 11. And I, 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 every time it came out, I'll speak out John 10, 10. We say, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and to destroy. Satan's assignment on the earth in your life is very straightforward. He wants to steal from you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy you. And he, 
humanity has been at his mercy even until now. But Jesus said, I came that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Then verse 11, he said, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. The good shepherd keeps, gives his life for the sheep. But a hireling, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, the, sorry, the sheep, see the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. Do we see the process by which the, the people are scattered and weary and tired because the enemy comes in and there is no shepherd to protect the sheep from the enemy. The hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. Hallelujah. It says the hireling flees because he is a hireling and does not care about the sheep. I am, verse 14, I am the good shepherd and I know my sheep. And I am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. Hallelujah. Very powerful and profound words. This is what Jesus is calling us to. To shepherd God's flock. In Jeremiah 3.15 he said, I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. What is required of us at this time? Moving forward into a new year. This situation we have in the world just, I mean, it happened by, on us. I mean, it just came unexpected. But we are in it. How can we become effective? How can we rise above it? and reach out to others. How can we bring the love of Jesus, the mercy of God, because God needs a witness. That's the other thing he keeps saying. I was discussing uh, with my prayer team on, on Monday, that God is looking for a witness. Isaiah 43 verse, verse, verse 10, he talked about that. He's looking for a witness. Uh, Acts 22 uh, verses 14 and 15, he was, Paul was saying, I was called to be a witness. God is looking for a witness because the world needs to know that there is hope. The world needs to know that they can, they can find solace. The world needs to know that there is healing available. The world needs to know that there is deliverance. The world needs to know. The people in our churches need to know. So God is looking for you and I to shepherd his flock. Hence the question, do you love me? That is why we must look at our leadership from the perspective of our love for Jesus. Hallelujah. As shepherds, we are required to lay down our lives and give our lives for the flock. These days, the flock carry, carry the leader. The flock carry the shepherd. We have become God kings to our flock. When we are to lay our life, Jesus washed the feet of Peter and the other disciples as an example of the kind of leadership that he wants from them. He said a good shepherd lays down his life. Are we willing to lay down our lives for the flock? As shepherds, we are required to know and tend and care for the flock. As shepherd is, shepherds, it's our responsibility to keep the flock healthy and flourishing by providing good pastures and leading them beside still waters. Read Psalm 23 and you will know the works of the shepherd. As shepherd, we are required to protect the flock from sicknesses and diseases. As shepherds, we are required to protect the uh, flock from going astray. People are being deceived left and right. And we don't care because we ourselves do not seek the truth that we might feed accurately the people God has called us to. As shepherds, we are supposed, we're required to protect the flock from deception and danger. Sheep's going astray is an easy thing. Sheep, sheep are dumb. They are dumb, the dumbest animals, and God is using that to describe humanity. And that is why we need, we need to hear the heart of Jesus at this time. 
because the world needs help. As shepherds, we are to ensure that the flock grows and thrives and is preserved. This kind of leadership is selfless, selfless, sacrificial leadership. The Lord called the shepherd leadership. And shepherd leadership, only, only the only qualification for shepherd leadership is love. Love for God. Absolute love for God and unconditional love for humanity. That is the only thing that motivates us in this kind of leadership. It is selfless. A broken world needs servant leadership. Hallelujah. Our work as shepherds must be selfless and sacrificial. We can no longer be selfish, self-centered, fame-seeking, money-grabbing, and unconcerned about what goes on around us. It, it's a real shame, and it has been telling. When the churches were shut down, the way pastors and leaders complained left and right, complaining about uh, 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 the, the, the offering not coming in, complaining, and, and, oh God, if I tell you what the Lord told me, to break your heart. How many of the pastors, how many, how many pastors have called? How many of your congregation have you called since all this started? Yet we have sought to think what is the best way to get the offering? What is the best way? Do we know what our, our, our flock, what our, our, our congregation members are going through? Do, you, do we know how they are coping? Do you know what is happening with their families? Do we know their mental state, the, the state of their mental health in the midst of what is going on? Have we cared? I know we can't do it all, but have we put systems in place to make this happen? Because this is what will make a difference in the coming year. This is what the world will see. God is saying, we must answer that question. Do you love me why are you in leadership why are you in ministry because this is if it is not out of your love for for me for jesus then you're wasting your time that's why he said on that day people will come and say i heal the sick i did this i did that i did that and he will say go away from me i do not know you i don't know you our broken world is in need of leadership shepherd leadership not tyrants, not hirelings. We cannot continue to be hirelings. When we look at Jesus' description of the hireling, I remember uh, watching a, a video clip and a so-called, at the beginning of the pandemic, a so-called prophet was saying that somebody called him that the brother has got coronavirus and that he should come in and 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 pray and he insulted the person he said did jesus heal coronavirus so why should he be the person and then he announced that nobody should call me you know that this person is a hireling this person does not love jesus this person is not called into leadership lord help us because I want you to hear the heart of the Father as I, I speak. Hallelujah. We cannot continue to be selfish, self-centered, fame-seeking, money-grabbing, and unconcerned about what goes on in the lives of the sheep. We cannot continue to be hirelings. The criteria, motivation, and drive for shepherd leadership is love love for jesus we must serve the lord out of love and not out of duty or out of what we will get into our pockets or out of what the fame we will get or out of the acknowledgement we will get no we it's time for us to evaluate our love for jesus hallelujah we must serve the lord out of love not just duty if we serve him out of duty we will become hirelings and neglect it's so easy for us to stop and neglect the sheep 
It is only through love for Jesus that we can lay down our lives for others. It is the love of Jesus, that our love for Jesus, that will help us love the world. We need to have such a love for Jesus that will make us compassionate towards others. The father told me years ago, he said, without compassion, you will not see my power. So it is something I pray, I pray earnestly for. Father, soften my heart towards humanity. Make me compassionate. Make me feel like you would feel their pain. And it is time that as leaders, we began praying and saying to the father, soften my heart tenderize uh, my heart. That's uh, Pablo Perez's songs. Come and tenderize my heart to see as you see, to love as you love. We need compassion. I want to say to you and I that there is the need for deep self-reflection as leaders a need for self-evaluation to reveal our hearts and motives at this time. Some are giving up. Why are you giving up? Why are you giving up? We, the, the concept of laying down our lives, of taking up our cross daily to follow him, we have lost it down the line. So when, when, when oppression comes, when challenges come, we feel like giving up and we abandon the flock. Why? There's a need for reflection. We must go back and like Peter, consider over and over again. Peter was the man who abandoned Christ and Christ had to get him to face himself with the question, do you love me? Will you abandon my flock like you abandoned me? In the midst of challenges, he said, if you love me, then you can, you qualify to walk in my shoes. We are walking in his shoes calling ourselves by all titles, big, big titles left and right. Can we carry his cross? Can we feel his pain? He said to me once, you have to love me. And you can, to love me, you must embrace my church. And my church will wound you. But when, as she wounds you, let her wounds show you how vulnerable she is so that you can reach out and help her. Said, if you, if you come into my love and my brains, the thorns will pierce you. But that is the price. Are we willing to pay it? The price of love. May God help us. May God help us. First Corinthians chapter 13. I want to quickly read from verses 1 to 8, and then I'll read verse 13. We are talking about what? Love-driven leadership. May God help us. First Corinthians 13. He says, Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have faith, so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked. Love does not think evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether they are prophecies, they will fail. Whether they are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. It's saying that all the things we hold dear, all the things we've put here, prophetic this, prophetic that, uh, 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 speaking in tongues, uh, uh, having so much knowledge, all the things that we have made big, they will all pass away. But not love. It says now, verse 13, abide these three, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love goes beyond your faith. It goes beyond your uh, hope. 
the greatest is love. Our calling to is to you need to go back to the scripture and you need to meditate on it. You need to ask God to work this in your heart to reveal to you what love, agape, unconditional love is because that is where God is bringing us back to as the way forward in our new normal, in our new world. Hallelujah. Our calling is to is not is to love, not just to duty and works. Not to systems, not to strategies. Simple heart of love for Jesus that reflects in compassion, seeing the brokenness of humanity and reaching out with a solution because we have the solution. May God help us. God's love for humanity is what motivated him to send Jesus. The Bible tells us, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It is God's love, not judgment, that motivated Jesus Christ to come. God so loved the world. God still loves the world. God loves the unbelievers. God loves the people out there who don't know him. God loves the people in the nations who, 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 have, who seem to have rejected and rebelled against him. Jesus died for every single one of us. Hallelujah. He died a cruel death to save humanity. When did we take this out of the gospel? When did we think that ended? No. His, his pain, when you go to uh, Revelation 5, when he was declared as the Lion of Judah, he appeared as a lamb in his blood. We are called to demonstrate the love of God to the world. The love that called, sent him to the cross to redeem humanity. We cannot reveal God's love to the world unless we demonstrate and experience. We cannot reveal God's love to the world unless we demonstrate his love, the love we have experienced from him to the world. The only way we can reveal God's love to the world is to demonstrate it to the world. Hence the question, do you love me? I see a paradox every time I reflect on this. And the paradox is that we cannot truly respond to the question, do you love me? Without first finding the answer to the question in Jesus himself. The question he asks, the answer is found in him. Do you love me? Do you love me? The answer is in himself. And this is, this is what I find awesome about our God. That he's not leaving us just to come to a place of loving him. But the Bible says that he loved us first so that we can love him. So I said the paradox is that we cannot respond to the question of love without finding the answer in Jesus, the one who posed the question. For we can only truly love Jesus when we have first discovered and received his love. When we have received his forgiveness, his kindness, his mercy, his grace, and his care. And that is what he is offering us, to come to the place of his, his grace, to come to the place of his mercy, to come back. And that's why it's a coming back to the fundamental truths, to come back to the place of his compassion, to come back to the place of his care. It is time to abandon all those strategies. Do this, do that, do that, do that. And just turn to Jesus. And allow his love to flow through us to a dying world. God has made it possible for us to love him by first loving us. You need to give him glory for that. That he has made, he's not just asking us the question, but he has made it possible for us to love him by first loving us. First John chapter 4. I'll read from verses 7 to 11 
and then verse 19, 1 John chapter 4. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God loved us, if God so loved us, we ought to also ought to love one another. Verse 19, we love him because he first loved us. He loves us. Jesus loves us. It is not just when he went on the cross. His love is unending. The love, there's a hymn, he says, Oh, love that will not let me go. I rest my wearied soul on thee. I give thee back the life I owe. We need to come back to this place of exhaling and inhaling his peace, inhaling his joy, of letting his spirit refresh us, of uh, we, we need to come back of seeing things from another perspective. Hallelujah. We are to receive the love of Jesus and reflect what we see. We are to fix our gaze on Jesus and reflect what we see. Therefore, the question to Peter, do you love me, can be rephrased. Can you reflect what you see when you gaze in the mirror of my heart? Can you see my heart, Peter? And what you see in my heart, can you see how far I went for humanity, Peter? And if you see it, can you reflect what you see? This is a question Jesus is asking us. Can we see his pain for the world? And can we carry that pain and do something about it? Or allow him to do something about it through our lives and our ministries? Something must change. The conferences, if they are not producing strength to God's people, if they are not enabling God's people to rise up, if they are not giving them hope, if they are not leading them to know Jesus, we're wasting our time. We're wasting our time with our TV programs. We're wasting our time with, with all the things we are, we are investing money in. We're wasting our time. If the end result is not that the sheep are made healthier. I really want you to hear the heart of the Father in this. Love for the sheep is what must motivate us to start that TV program. Hallelujah. Until we have gazed in the mirror of the Lord's heart and in gazing, not seeing a reflection of our wretched self, but his abundant grace, his abundant mercy, his loving kindness, we can never truly love him back or serve him by tending the sheep. So this is why we have the Holy Spirit. The Father is saying it is time to draw closer to Jesus. It is time to get to know him more personally and deeper. It is time to surrender to the Holy Spirit and allow him to have control of our lives again and our affairs and our activities. It is time to live spirit-led lives. We must be willing for the Holy Spirit to change and transform us into Christ-likeness. It is time to de devote attention to the word and to commit earnest and firm, to earnest and fervent prayer. It is time to make our prayer lives about Jesus. We've prayed about Satan for too long. We've prayed in the, in the it amazes me that in the, the Lord's prayer, Jesus gave no attention to Satan. Yet now we have made prayer all about Satan. It is time for us to stop it. It is time to talk to God about our relationship with him and the dying world. How do we reach out to the dying world? It is time for us to fast and say, Lord, give us strategies for evangelism. It is time for us to say, Father, even if I will go hungry, I will go out there to witness. It is time 
to say the, the, the food I will eat, I will use it for, to feed somebody. It is time. Hallelujah. It is time to develop an attitude of humility and obedience. To seek God's mind and will and follow it. Bringing my message to an end. I want to say that I'm convinced that that encounter with Jesus, that those quest, that question or those, the repeated question Jesus asked Peter, Peter never forgot. I am convinced about that. I am convinced that it became the defining uh, uh, point of Peter's ministry. I am convinced that everything Peter did flowed from that. And I can show you in the scripture why I am convinced. Because Peter passed the same instructions on to us in 1 Peter chapter 5. I'll read from verses 1 to 4. In 1 Peter 5, 1 to 4. I'll read in the New King James Version and then read from the Passion Translation. The New King James Version, this is Peter writing. It says, the elders who are among you. And he's talking about the leaders, the ministers. It says, the elders who are among you, I exalt. I who am a fellow elder and witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God. This is what Peter wrote to us. Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for honest gain, but eagerly. Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that will not pass away. The man who was asked the question passed it on what it means to us in writing. The Passion Translation says, Now I encourage you as an elder, and I'm encouraging that you as a minister, I'm encouraging you as an elder, an eyewitness of the sufferings of Christ, and one who shares in the glory that is about to be unveiled. I urge my fellow elders among you to be compassionate shepherds who tenderly care for God's flock and who feed them well, for you have the responsibility to guide, protect, and oversee. You have the responsibility. Peter said, consider it a joyous pleasure and not merely a religious duty. Lead from the heart under God's leadership, not as a way to gain finances dishonestly. Don't lead to make money. He said lead in a way, as a way to get, Lead from the heart under God's leadership, not as a way to gain finances dishonestly, but as a way to eagerly and cheerfully serve. Don't be controlling tyrants, but lead others by your beautiful examples to the flock. To the flock. And when the shepherd king appears, you will win the victory crown of glory that will not fade away. Hallelujah. From what Peter said, I put down eight points that can help me become a love-driven shepherd leader. I said to be effective and for us to have dynamic leadership, cutting-edge leadership in the coming year and the years beyond, we need to turn to the principle of love. Love for Jesus, and absolute love for Jesus, and unconditional love for humanity. And the question Jesus is asking us is the question he asks Peter, do you love me? If you love me, then you can consider yourself my, my, my servant. You can, I, I can trust you to commit my flock into your hands. And the flock Jesus is looking at, he says he, he looked at humanity, and he saw the multitudes as sheep without a shepherd, weary, lost. And that is the world we have now. And God is looking for laborers. 
God is looking for people through whom he can reach out to this dying world, through whom the world will know of, his, of, of him as the compassionate God, as the God of, of tender mercies, as the God oh, who lifts the fallen, as the God who will not break a bruised reed. Hallelujah. How do, can we become this? From what Peter said, the instructions Peter gave us from 1 Peter. First of all, we need to ask God to give us a heart for the flock. I'm coming to an end in a few minutes. We need to ask God to give us a heart for the flock. That should be our prayer. Focus. Lord, give me a heart for the flock. Help me to develop compassion, especially for the lost. Not just those. And you need to know the flock God has committed to you. Not just those who are in church, but those out there. The people in your area, your area of influence. Ask God to help you to see them. The person in your office who annoys you so much. Ask God to help you see that person as he sees that person. So that you can reach out. So we need to pray and ask God, give me a heart for the flock and help me develop compassion, especially for the lost. Secondly, we need to begin to pray for the flock. First of all, the ones that God has committed into your hands, call them by name, bring them before the Father, pray for their families. I said, it's time to stop chasing Satan. Look, the guy is moving through and flow the earth. He doesn't have time for you. God is greater. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Focus on your assignment and God will fight for you. If there is an attack, he will show you and teach you how to fight it. Now spend your time praying for the flock. Bring them before the Father. Pray for those in your sphere of influence who are not yet saved. Ask God to show you practical ways to help them. Prayer answers all things. Thirdly, it's time for us to reach out, reach and tenderly care for God's flock. Feed them through preaching, through teaching, sharing the word. Invest time in them. It means that you need to invest time in studying. Ezra, the Bible says of Ezra in Ezra 7 uh, verse 10, that Ezra set himself to study the word and to live it. And then to teach others to do the same. It is time for us to start doing that. Ask the Holy Spirit for wisdom and understanding in how to demonstrate his love for the people. Especially how to, to share the gospel to others. Share. It is the sharing, the feeding that we, we tend and care for them. Hallelujah. Fourthly, guide the flock down the paths of righteousness. Guide them into the paths of righteousness. Take a stand for truth. It is time now. All those, you know, halfway there. Oh, it's okay. If, if, if uh, fornication is, is, is now, uh, uh, when is outdated to tell people not to fornicate and all of that, we need to stop it. We need to come to truth. Truth is absolute. And we need to take a stand for truth. And we need to guide the people to the truth of God's word. They will say, yes, you are judgmental. Everything is okay. Keep your focus. Because you love them, you must tell them. And uh, do not compromise on the word. It is time for us to no longer compromise on the word, word. But be bold to speak the words of righteousness in love. Don't be afraid to correct. Don't be afraid to admonish the flock. If you know me, my teams know me. I'm not afraid to do that. Because I know that there, 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 there are great, if Jesus was not afraid to reprimand or admonish, and I'm not afraid to even be admonished by God or anyone who, uh, who can speak into my life. No, it helps me grow. Don't be afraid to correct. Some of my team, uh, our country director, one country director, when I have corrected her, she has, the, the, the way this woman has expressed humility and thanked me, and I've seen her use what I, I, I share with her to build herself up. And I'm like, if I had kept quiet, this woman would be walking. I'm saying it's time to guide 
the, the flock, the sheep, down the paths of righteousness. Number five, protect the sheep. I'm gathering this from what Peter told us in 1 Peter chapter 5. Protect the sheep, especially protect them from deception. Invest time in studying and teaching them, like I said. Help them to recognize the truth. Help them. Listen, when you teach them the truth, when they go to those meetings and they hear something, they will know it's false. They say banks don't teach their, their cashiers to recognize counterfeit. They teach them to recognize the true currency. So when they hold one that is fake, they are able to identify it. Teach them the standard of truth. That will be a protection over them. Hallelujah. Lead number six, lead by example. Lead by example. Don't become a tyrant or a dictator. Learn from Jesus and let his examples in the gospel guide you in how you are to relate. He related even with sinners. He ate with them and, and the Pharisees complained. He wept when Lazarus died. He reached out to all kinds of people. Jesus did. He led by example. May God give us the grace to do so. That his example will learn from his example in how to relate with each other, with others, and reach out to others. In how we can become a source of help, strength, and encouragement to them. The Holy Spirit is at hand to help us. The power of the Spirit is there to help us. Hallelujah. When we step into this, we are going to see a greater move of the power in our lives. Because God's power will be at work. We lay hands on the sick, they will be healed. We cast out demons, they will go to set people free. We give people beautiful ashes, the oil of joy for mourning. We raise oaks of righteousness. Hallelujah. Verse uh, number seven, do all these things joyfully as unto Jesus. Ask the Holy Spirit for the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, love, peace, meekness, kindness, gentleness, patience, self-control, long-suffering. Ask the Holy Spirit, work this in me. Help me receive the love of Jesus that I can love others. Finally, I want to say, expect a reward. Because God will reward you. There is a reward. That is what Peter told us. Like I said, the world is looking for leadership in desperate need. The people are out there lost. You see it in their eyes when you pass by them. There is no hope for many. And Jesus is seeing them. And Jesus is asking us the question because Jesus is looking for laborers who would go out and reach out to this dying world. And by the world, I'm not just talking about unbelievers. I'm saying some of them are even in our own churches. Many are in our churches. But God is seeking you and I to come to the place of love. We need to consider the question, do I love Jesus? How much do I love Jesus? Because love should cause us to lay down our lives. Love should cause us to take up our cross. Love should cause us to sacrifice, to abandon our own uh, 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 dreams, to embrace the dream of Jesus, the salvation, healing, and restoration of our dying world. May the Lord help us in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, I hope you've been blessed. It's not, not been an easy message to preach. I've been preaching to myself. But I hope you've been blessed. And I want us to just spend time has gone. Uh, forgive me for going over time. I want us to spend uh, about a couple of minutes and just pray. And just consider the question, do you love me? I see names here. I see Rose, I see Janet, I see Clara. I see Stella, and the question is, do you love me? Jesus is asking each and every one of us. Because that is the only thing that will qualify us. That is the only thing. 
that will qualify us. And that is the only thing that will help us make a difference in this broken world. In Jesus' name, let us pray. Oh, Father, we stand, O oh God, before your presence. Like Peter, we are perplexed that you will even ask us. But you are asking and we must consider. And you are asking over and over again. The world is precious to you. You love the world so much that you died. Humanity is broken and humanity is precious to you. What is happening out there grieves your heart. But sin has brought us this far. Yet you have overcome sin and your kingdom is open for the world to come in to find refuge, to find solace, to find comfort, to find healing, to find deliverance. And we have the key, Lord. Father, I pray for everyone who can hear my voice. I pray for myself. I ask that you have mercy on us. Bring us to the, if there is any who needs to know your love. Is there is any who is going through the very same things you are describing? I pray that by your spirit, you reach out to them and send other believers to go to them and comfort them. But Lord, I'm asking that we will come to the knowledge of your love for us, your deep love for us, Jesus. And that we, in coming to that knowledge of your love, we will reach out to others in love. We will reach out to the world in love. We will influence the world to get to know you. We will influence the world, Lord. Through our lives, the world will come to know that there is hope, Lord. This is our prayer. This is our heart cry. Love-driven leadership is what the world needs. So, Father, give us the grace, Lord, to come to this place. We humble ourselves before you. We cannot do it on our own. Only you can do it through us. We surrender ourselves to you and say, do it through us, Lord. We worship you. We say thank you. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We invite you into our lives to take control, to make us, to mold us and to use us for your glory. He said, the Isaiah prophesied it and Jesus said it, that the spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor, to open prison doors, to set captives free, to give beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, garments of uh, 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 praise for heaviness, beauty for ashes. And in doing so, raise up oaks of righteousness planted by the Lord. Father, help us surrender to your spirit that he will do this through us. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. We love you. We say thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. And amen. Well, I hope you have been blessed and um, uh, I pray that uh, the Father will help us. But there are good things ahead. Each of us will bring in a harvest into the kingdom. Amen. God richly bless you and have a good night. Amen. Bye-bye.